Please welcome to the stage Aaron McKean. Good morning. So, um, I am the female founder of a VC-backed Silicon Valley tech startup that has nothing to do with fashion. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I don't believe I exist either. And because I'm a little bit of an outlier, people often ask me, well, how did you do it? How, how did this happen? And so I'm like, okay, it, 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 this is what you do. First, uh, you should become an expert in a field that produces mundane objects in an arcane way um, <laughs> that nobody really understands, but that most people have a, a deep and inexplicable residual goodwill of, around. <laughs> and, and then you get invited to talk about your crazy idea about how to make this arcane, mundane thing differently at a conference that you didn't even really know existed until you were signed up to speak at it. And then, uh, yeah, this was, rhymes with Fred. And, um, and then you should try and use the word synecdochically in, in the talk. That, that goes over really well. Um, and then you should make sure, you know, on your checklist, uh, that there is an iconoclastic investor in the audience who really actually loves your field and who is immediately convinced by your talk, like, and by immediately I mean comes up to meet you after you get off stage, takes you out to lunch that day, that you should really work on your idea like full time. And he spends the next year convincing you to start a company. Um, that's like three simple steps. <laughs> like, and, and so when I tell people that, they're all like, uh, maybe I'll learn to code. Um, and and so, so now you're saying like, okay, Aaron, that's nice and all, but I, I distinctly heard you say VC backed. And isn't XOXO all about like independent creators? I mean, somebody's texting the Andes right now going, there has been a terrible mistake. Um, uh, oh. And in case you're wondering, the collective noun is an enthusiasm of Andes. And, <laughs> so, so the iconoclastic investor is Roger McNamee, and he is like a really wonderful human being. And I, I have a pro tip, like if you're considering working with somebody, and, and, you're, and they're like, I want you to meet my spouse, like, make sure they're as awesome as Anne McNamee, because, like, that's a really great sign if, if, you know, if they've already picked somebody awesome to, like, be in their life. Anyway, so before the Andes can come and fix it, and, like, get me off stage, uh, I want to talk about six and a half things that I have learned the hard way. And, and the first thing is actually um, independence is a myth. It's, <laughs> it's something that we valorize and, and that we talk about, but Every maker is dependent on somebody. Like, in the vacuum of space, no one can help you make. And, um, it, 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 and the important thing is that you might be depending on your investors or your Kickstarter backers or your day job or Patreon or your spouse or your subscribers or your thousand true fans or your mom, but unless you're independently wealthy and incredibly reclusive, you, you're depending on somebody. And it might be for money, it might be for emotional support, it might be for obsequious fawning, it, 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 it might be for like pressure, external deadlines, so that you actually feel like you gotta get stuff done. But you're depending on somebody uh, for something. And you should really know and understand what you're hoping to get from the people that you're depending on. You should really think about it. And, and when I first started WordNick, I knew a lot of things, but those things were mostly about dictionaries. And I, I knew that this was what I wanted to do. I wanted to have every word. I wanted meaning uh, to be represented by usage. And yes, I wanted every word, every single word. And, um, 
if you want to argue with this thesis, please feel free to come and talk to me at the party tonight, you know, tell me that some words are just not worth it, but I should warn you that I don't drink, and if we argue about this and you're drunk and I'm sober, I'm going to win. <laughs> and, um, and, but the good thing is, is that if you're drunk enough, you won't remember losing the argument. But this is really, really what I wanted to do, because I, I truly believe that, that quantity has a quality all of its own. Um, evidently, according to the internet, Stalin also believed this, but um, uh, it, it's true. Like, I thought that if we could get every word, that, that, that it would transcend being just a dictionary, and it would become something that I wasn't really going to be able to predict. Um, but that meant that there were some serious things that I, I really didn't know about. Um, like, for example, this corner question. Um, <laughs> yes, how does WordNick make money? The sheer amount of data and traffic that the site has to deal with leaves me wonder, what bird, what's WordNick's business model? Um, so, of course, this is the answer that I put up. Uh, <laughs> so, this is my most ever upvoted Quora answer, by the way. Um, I hope you can see the very, very cheery, hope this helps, down here at the bottom. Um, uh, another thing I learned yesterday is that Bandcamp's graphic design team is way better than me. And, um, and of course, uh, uh, the first couple people to upvote it were actual WordNick employees at the time, so I was like, yeah, they've got faith. And, <laughs> Yeah, so there were tons and tons of things I didn't know. And I didn't understand. Like, at the beginning, I, I, I knew that having a giant map, essentially, of the English language would be useful, but I didn't, I couldn't imagine what the use cases could be. So, like, I didn't think there would be a thousand Twitter bots. Thanks, Darius. Um, I mean, there, there's well over, well over, I haven't even looked at the latest number, well over, uh, well over 10,000 people signed up for the WordNick API. We've served well over a billion and a half API calls. People are doing all sorts of fun things with it that I could have never imagined. And then, like, this is what we made ourselves. This is the, the reverb. You know, the company's now called Reverb um, because we were going to people and said, hey, we could do all this cool stuff. And they said, yeah, and you're a giant dictionary. Um, so we rebranded to Reverb. Uh, note the verb is still in there. But um, yeah, so we, we were able with this giant map of the English language to build a word graph that really helps people find the cool stuff that they want to read about that's based on their actual interests and not on their demographics. Right? You know, I'm a middle-aged mom. If I relied on demographics for giving me content, I would learn way more about Clorox wipes than I <laughs> like, really want to know. But this is my actual screen. Like, I like haiku and node and roller disco and sewing and XOXO. And you know, so we built this thing. And I, I have to try not to sound so like, incredulous when I describe how it works. But the thing is, is like, I am so happy that this thing that I knew was theoretically possible turned out to be practically awesome. Like, people spend like, uh, five to eight times longer in our iOS apps than they do in competing apps, because we're giving them what they want. People click through to the stuff that we suggest to them, like two orders of magnitude higher than they do from competing people, because we're giving people stuff that is not about celebrity boob job disasters. And so it's really interesting stuff. And so when I was thinking about who I was going to depend on, I thought, there's this writer, Andrew Boyd, and he talks about when you fall in love with someone, nobody's perfect. So you have to be able to look at that person and say, this is the problem I want to have. <laughs> you know, like, this is the problem I want to have. And so if the problem with investors is that they will push you to get big, I was like, well, duh, I want to make a map of English that is at the scale of one to one. You know, somebody pushing me to get bigger is probably a good thing. So when you pick the people that you're going to depend on, the most important thing to think about is, do they have the same goals that you do? And will they push you to be better? And, and I think one of the other things I've learned the hard way, um, in a way that everybody can be better, is like you have to admit your bias. And uh, for the non-sewing people, that's something called bias tape. Um, and it took me a really long time to admit that I have a pretty dangerous bias. And, and that is like my mental image 
of a competent person is someone who has a real is like has really strong opinions. I really like to work with people who have strong opinions. So why is this dangerous? So <laughs> um, the and you know it took me a long time that I associated loud and kind of aggressive with competent, and that is not the case. A really significant percentage of the time, there's a lot of overlap there. And admitting this bias about myself gave me actually a lot of empathy for other people's bias because it can be really hard to struggle against your own worldview about what feels right, right? What makes you feel comfortable is not always the right thing. And sometimes your pattern recognition is way off. And, and it's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to think about your own bias and to consciously think, this person makes me feel about them in a certain way. Is that actually true? Let me look at the data. Um, and just because it's hard, though, does not mean it's not worth doing. You really have to do it. And another thing that's hard, um, growing up is hard. Like when you first, when you first start something, it's kind of like having a kid. This is my son Henry, and you know when you have a little kid, you're like, I control your universe. Everything that happens to you, I have you know explicit control over. And, but as they get older, of course, as they get bigger, you have to let go more and more. You have to be okay with them having their own lives and, and, and being more independent. And um, <laughs> so uh, he, the, my son Henry gave me permission to use this photo, but only because his hero, Hank Green, was here. So thanks, Hank. Um, <laughs> so yeah, he's 14 now. Um, and I, I feel like it's hard to remember sometimes that something that can't have a life without you is actually a parasite, right? <laughs> you really, really want, you really, really want things to um, uh, be independent, to grow, to, to not need your hand on the wheel at all times. And, uh, and again, just like parenting, there have been a lot of days where I'm like, I am so bad at this, like really, really terrible. And every time that I feel useless and incompetent and ignorant and I dream of running away to Portland where I can write artisanal JavaScript and work on my second novel, um, <laughs> like, you know, I, I, I try to remember, really, the only way out is through. The only way out is through. If I woke up tomorrow and I stopped doing the thing that I love doing, I would regret it the rest of my life. It doesn't matter how hard it is. It doesn't matter how stupid I feel. It doesn't matter how stupid other people tell me I am. I am just gonna do it every single day. And if I'm having a bad day, if I'm trapped in a miasma of like fear and uncertainty and doubt, this is what you'll hear me muttering under my breath. It's a little scary, actually. I try not to do it on public transit. Um, <laughs> so like the only way out is through. And I tell myself, if I, if I learned one thing in a day, if I learned one new thing in a day, then it's an okay day, it's not a wasted day, even if it's something stupid like baconados are skewers of bacon-wrapped jalapeno cheese balls. That was something I learned on August the 13th, and uh, you know, learned it through reading in our app. And I was like, okay, I learned something today. Day's not a total waste. And um, I didn't eat any of those things. I just learned about them. I didn't have direct experience, you know, which is new knowledge from observation and experience. This was only observation um, and inferring relationships between known things. Uh, noogenesis. I learned this word while putting together the stock. So thank you uh, to the person who suggested that particular word. Um, and I feel like acknowledging when you've learned something new is important because feeling incompetent is exhausting. It's really hard. Which um, I mean, I also learned, and I think it's really important uh, to occasionally indulge in meaningless competence. And uh, so, uh, you've got to find something that you like to do, and where you can say, "Damn, I got this. I'm good." Like, and by meaningless, I, I don't mean that it shouldn't be meaningless to you, like Sudoku. Um, but uh, there's no words involved in Sudoku. What is the actual point? Um, <laughs> like, but and for me, like, I, I just think you should choose something where there are no real com consequences if you screw it up. And for me, that's making dresses. Um, and people often ask me if, like, 
I want to sew for other people, or I want to be a fashion designer, and haven't I ever thought of going on Project Runway, and wouldn't I want to create product patterns to sew, and, and I am like, hell no. Hell no, because that would turn my fun escapist hobby into an actual job with people I would have to depend on and please and make happy and think about. And when I sew dresses now, I do it exclusively for myself. And now I can make a dress and if nobody likes it, I'm like, yeah, too bad, sorry, I like it. Um, and I put the word occasionally here uh, because I feel like you can, um, you can totally overindulge in your meaningless competence uh, hobby um, because you get that little rush, like you're pleased with something you made and you feel good and you're like, hey, I got this. And um, so let's just say I have a very extensive wardrobe. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I haven't really learned the occasionally part. I occasionally overindulge in meaningless competence. Um, unfortunately, like making and wearing goofy dresses has uh, not really helped me overcome one criticism that I hear a lot. And I, I think a lot of women hear this criticism, and people like to tell me, you're too nice. You're really too nice. And so I, like, for a while, I practiced having a bitch face. And <laughs> unfortunately, like, um, my attempts at bitch face were usually interpreted by people to think that that meant they should come up and ask me for a dollar. And um, so I was really bad at it. And I thought, OK, well, why, why am I trying to be meaner, to be sterner, to not be so nice? And so, but instead of fighting my natural inclination, I'm also a southerner too, so I, I kind of reached back and, and thought into my like ancestral knowledge and realized you can weaponize nice. <laughs> um, that bunny will cut you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it is possible to tell somebody to go to hell in a way that they look forward to the trip. <laughs> and, but, I, I, I feel like nice gets a bad rap because a lot of the people who tell you, oh, you're too nice, they have had lives where they've never really run into the situation of where they've asked somebody to directly to do something and that person says no, right? They often have a lot of power, they have a lot of privilege, like they have a life where they can just tell people to do stuff. And I feel like it's amazing how much more you can accomplish and how much faster you can move if you actually really listen to people, especially to their complaints or their problems. And sometimes just listening solves the problem. You know, there's this thing called rubber duck debugging where like you're trying to tell your problem, your computer problem with somebody and they could be a rubber duck for all you care. It's just the process of talking about it solves the problem. And I feel like it's entirely possible to be empathetic to someone but not put their needs in front of your own, to not put their needs in front of the needs of the bigger organization. And you can be both nice and direct, and you can be both nice and ruthless. And nice does not mean doormat. I can nice you into an early grave if you piss me off fast enough. And, um, and I feel like being nice can also make you be a little bit underestimated um, uh, by people who don't think you're serious, and then they don't see it coming, right? So that's kind of a, uh, that's also kind of a little bit of an advantage. Um, so uh, speaking of underestimation, the thing that I've kind of half learned, you know, the six and a half things I've learned, um, uh, time is a flat circle. Actually, I have no idea what time is. I, uh, I, I, despite my best efforts and a gazillion different like trackers and to-do list apps, I still have no idea how long things will take. Like the closest I've gotten to estimation is like, uh, I think it takes four hours to make a dress, plus or minus four hours. <laughs> um, and, and I still tell people, oh yeah, it takes me four hours to make a dress. And uh, so the worst thing is that um, I, uh, <laughs> The worst thing is when people ask me when I'm going to get better at estimating how long things will take. <laughs> I'm like, I just told you. Um, so on that note, I think time's up. So um, thank you so much for your very kind attention. I look forward to talking to you all more. Last day.